Hey friends, I'm Sharon Betters, and this is the Help and Hope podcast produced by Mark Inc. Ministries. And our vision at Mark Inc. is to offer help and hope, especially to hurting people. And today I am so delighted to introduce to you a new friend, Christine Runge Weiss, who is the founder of Faith Wears Pink. And I hope that immediately you're thinking pink, that must mean breast cancer. And yes, it does. And I hope that the title of her uh, ministry tells you a little bit about what you're going to hear. Christine and I met through the internet and it is so exciting to me to know her. I feel like she's a friend already. I had breast cancer as a very young woman. I was 38 years old when I was diagnosed and I'm now 75. And so I am a good news story of God's healing in my own life. So it just delights me to bring to you Christine and to introduce to you the, a place of hope for those especially who are struggling with breast cancer. So Christine, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I love it how I organically meet people through this through this ministry. Yes, and our, our phone conversation, I, I just, I, well, listeners, you're going to hear the voice of a woman who, as, I think as soon as she meets someone, you're good friends. And so I hope you feel <laughs> that way as you hear her story. So Christine, tell us a little bit about yourself before we jump into your story. Sure. Well, I um, was raised in Wisconsin, a suburb of Milwaukee called Waukesha and Pewaukee. They're kind of a, a twin city there. Um, I'm 54. I have three kids. My oldest, Brooke, is 27 and she's married graduated from Texas A&M and she does marketing, which she's great at. My son is 25, his name is Cole, and he's in his third year of law school at SMU and is married, he got married last summer to his high school sweetheart. And they they live in downtown Dallas. And then my youngest, Kylie, is just graduated from Baylor University with a marketing degree. And she's doing her big girl job for the first time. And she moved back home for a little while, which is, it's fun having her back home. I do have my boyfriend named Ryan. And in fact, that's our picture right behind us of us at the beach this past summer. He has a daughter, Alicia, who's 35 and she's married and they just moved here from Washington. And then he had a 19 year old son that we lost back in February. His name was Alex. And then he has two little ones, a nine year old and a seven year old. And that's Miles and Chase. So we have, we have a big family together and that is, I love that. I love a big family and I'm a, I'm a self-employed hairdresser as well. Well, your family is going to keep getting bigger and bigger. Your house is going to be filled <laughs> with lots of laughter and joy as yes. your family grows and grows. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, Christine, one of the things that I've realized is sometimes when we are struck by an unexpected diagnosis or a crisis, it's not in isolation from other uh, crises. And your your life definitely has been filled with battering waves. So when yes. you experience that phone call, that those words that, yes, you definitely have cancer, yes, it wasn't, it wasn't an isolated crisis. So what happened before your uh, diagnosis? Well, you know, it's kind of funny because as I look back on it and I realized this as I've, you know, done my speaking events and things like that, that I was really going through what I now call a season of Job. And anyone that knows what Job suffered, it, it's, a, it's a series of events that you just, you get to the point you think you cannot handle it, anything else. I had my first marriage failed and I had three little children at the time, no family here in Dallas. My dad had a massive heart attack. I was very close with my dad and there was a lot of chaos with that. He survived it, which I was very grateful. Wow. No sooner did we get through that and my oldest daughter at the age of 12 was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And by that time I was already remarried and so there was a lot of I was already dealing with trying to blend a family of five children and we had bought a house and trying to sell two other ones. And so that was that crisis. And then that marriage failed after only two years, which of course, going through a second divorce, you really have to start looking within yourself. Like, why did I fail at two marriages? I, I've always pictured myself as a wife and a mom. So that was a, that was devastating. And then my family and I got into a huge disagreement and they basically 
they all live in Wisconsin, but I live here. And it turned into a isolation for me that they, the, the argument was so severe that, and that's just not like us at all. So I was very lonely at a time that I, I needed my family the most because I was, I just finished that divorce, the second divorce. Oh. And then my ex-husband, the father, my first husband is the father of my children. And he, out of nowhere, filed a custody battle that literally brought me to my knees. And that was a pretty dark time in my life because up to that point, we'd always gotten along really well. And as you all know, when you have to hire lawyers and, and things like that, it's, and you're fighting for your children, you're fighting for what is most important to you. So it was, that was, that was a year long battle. And literally I had just finished that and my dad had a stroke. Um, in fact, the, 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 I was up in Wisconsin for his stroke and came home and had my mammogram. So it was, it was exactly one month after his stroke that I was diagnosed. So I, I, I literally thought there can't be anything else I can possibly endure. <laughs> yeah. So just wave after wave. You, you Wave just, after wave. Down. You're getting your breath and another wave knocks you down. So, but I, but with each, with each wave of, of crisis, I was drawn closer and closer to the Lord and he kept showing up bigger and bigger. Um, um, you know, you don't always know what's going on and why you're having those crises, but you know, he's, he's, when he brings you to your knees, um, um, your only, your only option is to look up. <laughs> well, so, you know, it's, it's true. Either you look up to him or you run away and looking up to him and there's, there's hard places the, there's a great purpose in drawing us to him, driving us to him and Absolutely. getting to know him and, and, and experience his experience, his, his love. And one of the things that you shared with me is that while you were in the middle of learning about how you were, you had cancer and you were going to be facing chemotherapy, but there was a moment before you knew the diagnosis that you felt as though the Lord just touched you in a special way. Can you tell us, tell us about that? Yes. So I was 44 at the time of my diagnosis. And so it was 10 years ago. And I was at, I had, I had had several biopsies before. I was, I had never had a clear mammogram. My maternal grandmother died at 33 of, of breast cancer. So I really was not shocked. And I, I was at the biopsy again and I knew, you know, that I was going to have a bi. I was, I knew I was, no, I was at the sonogram. I'm sorry. And the doctor's like, well, we're going to schedule a biopsy. And he walked out of the room to go get the scheduler. And I was like, okay, Lord, this, I, I thought there's nothing else I can possibly endure. And I started to pray. I was like, Lord, you know that I've been through so much and I just really can't handle anymore. And at that moment, it was like someone put their hand over my mouth and said, Shh. and it was an audible Shh. Huh. And anyone who ever gets to experience that type of audible message from the Lord, it's, it's powerful. Huh. And he said to me, you're going to, basically, you're going to be fine. Yes, you have cancer. You're going to be fine. Praise me through this and watch what I do. Huh. So the doctor came back in and I, I had tears rolling down my, my face and he was, it was my birthday party that night. And he was like, Oh no, 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 don't, don't be sad. You know? And I said, doctor, are you a Christian? And he said, yes. And I said, I know I have cancer. Huh. And I, I had asked him on a scale of one to 10, how concerned he was. And he said a five. And I said, no, you don't get to pick five. Cause that's in the middle. That gives me no, <laughs> that gives me nothing. And I said, you have to pick four or six. And he said eight. Huh. So I knew, and I knew in my spirit that I had it. Yeah. I, I remember the day that I learned I had breast cancer and how devastating it was to me personally. Shocking, actually. It was just shocking. It that, is. Uh, because you feel fine. You, you don't feel sick. Correct. And, and all of a sudden, I mean, for me, I had to go through surgery and then very aggressive chemotherapy. And every month I would think, I feel fine until I go into the hospital and a week later, I don't feel fine anymore, but I, it's hard to, you have to believe what the doctors are telling you, but when they show you 
on your sonogram or your your x-rays then you you say okay there is something there and it's yeah it's going to destroy my body if i don't do something about it for sure when i always tell people the minute you hear you have cancer your life as you know it stops and you become a cancer patient. Now, I, I always referred to myself as a cancer warrior. I didn't like the word patient because to me that meant I was sick. Mm-hmm. And But your your life as you know it is changed. And I was always, I was a busy mom. You know, I had three kids. I had a mortgage. I had pets. You know, I had a salon business to run. And I used to say, oh, I don't have time. I don't have time. Well, I'll tell you what. When you get diagnosed with cancer, <laughs> it's amazing what you have time for. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, yeah, I think about back to when I was diagnosed and I was 30, 39 years old and we had four children and two in elementary and two in high school and yep. teaching Bible study. I mean, like you list all of your responsibilities. My husband's a pastor, so all of those things. But there were so many treasures along the way. One of the things yes. that God gave me after I had my surgery was Isaiah 45 verses two through three, where he says, I'll give you treasures in the darkness, riches stored in secret places so that you will know I am the Lord, your God, the one who calls you by name. And, you know, I I wanted, it was my moment. I wanted to believe that he was saying, you're going to be fine. But I knew that isn't what he was saying. He wasn't saying, I'm going to heal you. He was saying, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to walk with you and I'm going to give you treasures to remind you that I am sovereign and you can trust me and I know your name. And so I knew that there were little things along the way that would be meaningful to me, nobody else, but to me, like love notes from the Lord reminding me, I'm here, I'm here, even though you're not feeling so hot right now, I'm here with you. So you um, have a wonderful community and you uh, shared with me how your community, your friends just rallied around you. Can you tell us about that? And for two reasons, first of all, to as a, as a blessing to them to hear it once more if they listen to this, but also for those who are listening who want to know how do I help my friend who has this kind of a, a diagnosis? Yeah, so my, you know, my, remember my dad had just had a stroke and so my family was up in Wisconsin, rallied around him. Uh, and obviously, they had to be. And so I felt, at first, I was like, oh, my goodness, how am I going to do this by myself? I had these three kids. And, well, I, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm stubborn as a mule. And I, I'm a do-it-yourself kind of girl. And, of course, I was single. And I had to learn how to say yes. I had to learn how to, when people would call me and say, Christine, I'm at the pet store. Can I get you some dog food? My first reaction would be, no, I'm fine. I had to learn how to say yes to people. And if it, if, if it was they, them wanting to get me groceries, them wanting to make me a meal, and, and this is all things that did happen. You know, I had, I had one friend who every week of chemo, so I had chemo every three weeks, he would bring me for the first three days after chemo a glass of freshly squeezed that he would do himself apple juice. He had done this research on these apples and, and he would sit here and make me drink it in front of him. (laughs) I woke up one morning to someone, a a group of guys trimming my hedges up front. I had people offering to take my kids to school, to take them to their activities. Now you have to remember too, my ex-husband and I, who had always gotten along well, had just gone through that horrible court battle. Mm. So we were, our communication was to the point of emails only. And so orchestrating three busy children's lives, you know, it was that I I couldn't lean on him is what I'm saying. So I was and I had a church community that just rallied and prayed and, you know, a group of women were at the surgery with me. They I I, I was incredibly covered with with a tribe. I called them Team Christine. (laughs) Everybody needs a Team Christine. Yeah. 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 And I. And I've told people before, like, if you want to find out how loved you are, go through something like this. Mm. I don't, I don't recommend having to do that, but you will absolutely see people come out of the woodwork that, that you didn't even know loved you. I, I, um, you saying that reminds me of something I I have said is that I never felt more loved in my life until that season of life for the way that people cared for me. And yes. 
I would wish that for everyone. And I know that there are those of you who are listening, you don't have that kind of support. Maybe you are not in a church or you're new in a community. And we're, we're just, you know, sad that that is happening, but we'll pray that the Lord would guide you and, and connect you with at least one person that you can trust and, and depend on. And I, and I would speak to breast cancer warriors too. As you said, you have to be willing. I remember one of the women uh, at the church said, we are coming to clean your house whether you like it or not. So yeah. you can make a list for us if you want. You can make a list, but we're coming because I did not want them to come to, to clean. Yes. I didn't, I didn't have time to clean it before they got there. Kind Correct. I, I understand <laughs> that. Yeah. So, so just remembering we are all of flesh and God, I think community is one of the greatest gifts that God gives to us as his children. And he keeps a lot of his promises through his people, which Absolutely. is a pretty remarkable thing as uh, for us. And you, one of the worst things when I learned I had to have chemo was that I, I'm terrified of needles. I don't like needles and throwing up is, oh yeah, you know, that was all. I, I hate throwing <laughs> up me. and I, I did not want to lose my hair. I mean, yes. that seemed worse than cancer. All of it yes. seemed worse than cancer. And so here I am having back then it was over 30 years ago. I had to go into the hospital for four days and be hooked up to these chemicals that the nurses would wear three pairs of heavy rubber gloves because they didn't want it to touch them, wow. you know, yes. so wow. the, the, the poison is going into your body after I would think of Pac-Man, you know, that old, oh, that old game of little, the, the yes. like Pac-Man, but your yes. experience, thank the Lord, there are so many better treatments today, which is incredibly yes. wonderful. But your first chemo, your first visit for chemo really seem to shape your purpose in this journey. What happened? So, you know, it's a very nerve wracking day because it's all the unknown. You know, the first one is so scary. So my Texas mom, I called her, she was a, a dear friend of mine and, you know, about my mom's age. And she just, she was the one that stayed in the hospital with me and she was awesome. But we walked into the chemo room and yes, the chemo room looks exactly like how it looks in the movies. You know, the green medical recliners, the poles the you know, everyone's hooked up. There's a TV. Some people are sleeping. So I walked in nervous and my surgery was just three weeks before. So I felt like I was spinning and I was instructed just to grab a, a seat. And I sat down and there was a older woman sitting next to me and she looked incredibly tired and, you know, her, no hair. And she was actually just getting fluids that day. And I sat down and you know, I, or I sat down my coffee and my water and she looked at me and she said in a very quiet voice, first time. Oh. And I felt so guilty because I was like, oh yeah, you must know that because I, I still have my hair. Like I felt kind of guilty that I still had hair. And I'm like, I look so obvious because I still look, you know, like this. Oh. And, and I said, yeah, you can tell because I still have my hair. And she said, no. It's because you still have your smile. Wow. Oh, I just dropped my wow. earbud. That's okay. That's all right. Yeah. And um, right. you still have your smile is what she you said. You still have your smile. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I already knew what God, that God was doing something, that he was with me and I knew I was supposed to be doing this. And he was going to you know, glor be glorified in my journey. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I'm supposed to bring smiles and laughter and joy into this chemo room. Mm. So that and was that, that was a pivotal journey. moment. Yeah, that that is a bit of a moment because you know, speaking from experience, it is wearing. Chemo yes. is exhausting and it is wearing. But when you have a calling, you know that you know that you're there to reflect Jesus. That changes that changes everything. It's like you can take a deep breath and say, "Okay, Lord, I'm on mission. I'm on the battlefield." Yes, and it's about more than the physical problems that I have. You're, you're, you're a hairdresser, so you yes. care about hair and you know yes. how important hair is to women. And yet here you are knowing that you're probably going to lose your hair. So, but your girlfriends jumped in and what happened? <laughs> what happened with so, your hair? You know, it's so funny because remember I was single, I was dating, I was on match.com. I mean, I was, you know, living the single life and yes, we all love our hair and hair is one of our defining features. So I was, I was worried. 
Mm-hmm. And my, my oncologist had told me that it would be 10 to 14 days. So my childhood best friend who lived in Wisconsin, her mom is the reason I'm a hairdresser and she's a hairdresser. She flew down to Texas mm-hmm. to do the honors of shaving my head. Mm-hmm. And I had already bought a wig and, you know, and she was so excited about my wig. I, it was almost infectious. Mm-hmm. And so we, you know, we were out shopping one day and I, you know, went like this and had a clump uh-huh. and she was like, okay, let's go home and shave your head. Uh-huh. She was so excited. So she shaved my head and she's like, get your wig, get your wig. And she puts my wig on and she says, well, hello, Lexi. And I'm like, Lexi, who's Lexi? And she created this whole character uh-huh. for Lexi. Lexi had a marital status, a, a place to live, a car, a favorite beverage, favorite food, like she had this life. Well, that continued. And I ended up with being a hairdresser, I ended up with a bunch of wigs and they all had names and characters. And the great thing was, is everyone played along with me. <laughs> I mean, the you know, if I went on a date, you know a guy would be like well which wig is this and all my girlfriends all my clients everybody they just Uh, it just became a thing and it made it easier and I will tell you that I learned the most about beauty during that time that I was bald because you know at the end of the day as a woman you know and you're take your makeup off you're gonna take your hair off you know you have to look in the mirror and you have to see what true beauty is and yeah. it's not, it's not in your hair. It's uh, not in your makeup. It's not in your clothes. It's not in the jewelry you wear. <laughs> and, well, you know, that, Christine, what I, I can see another treasure really that God has given to you. And that is your platform for sharing those life lessons that yes. he has, he's given you like about beauty. I mean, your industry is about beauty. It's about physical beauty. And so, yes. To have someone who who knows what true beauty is, I think is a gift. That would be a Absolutely. gift. Absolutely. those. The other thing that I really appreciate, when I was diagnosed with cancer, you, ne- you didn't say the word. You didn't admit that you had cancer. And breast cancer is such an intimate, that might be hard for you to understand because it's your generation, thank God, has a whole different perspective. It's right out there. It's, it's open. Yes. And there's no problem talking about having breast cancer. But back then, it was very private and intimate, and you didn't say the word. And I noticed that when people would call or friends would check on me, they couldn't say the word. And, and so I began to say it to them. I have cancer. I have breast cancer. It took the sting out of it. It was as though I was taking the power away from, away from it. And I love the, the wig stories because you're <laughs> helping, you're actually helping your friends walk with you because yes. letting them know, yeah, this is hard, but that's, you know, let's do what we can to make it a little bit easier. And so yes. it's a personality thing. I do. I know that it's a personality thing, but I think also you're giving women freedom to find yes. that place for themselves you do talk about how cancer changes you. What are what are some of the ways that cancer has changed you? What are some of the the life lessons that you've learned through your cancer journey? Oh gosh, I think I learned how to slow down. Mm-hmm. I I think I, I I felt like before I had cancer, I felt like I I knew how to appreciate the little things. I I don't think I really did until after cancer. I definitely learned how to appreciate every little thing. I learned how strong I was. You definitely realize what you're made of when you go through something like that. I learned more about my faith than any other test that I ever had because mm-hmm. I just clung to him so much. And it was like he was right in, right here. Like I could, I could tangibly feel him. I learned to love deeper and not worry so much about tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I learned to just value all the, all the gifts of life that for every hard thing we go through, there's going to be those gifts that come with it. Or you might go through something dark today, but then tomorrow's going to be bright. So I knew, I know now if I'm having a a hard thing that I go through, I know it's not forever. Mm. And I know that I'm going to be 
have blessings and and um, things that come out of it that are going to be good. I, I pay attention to those things. It was funny because after I'd gone through it all, I was sitting with a girlfriend that had just been diagnosed, and I said to her, "You're going to smell the sunshine." Uh-huh. And I thought that's such a good description because it's a, we don't smell the sun. We don't go outside and smell sunshine, but that's a, that's a a visual that you can get that I can go outside now on a sunny day and just look up and I can smell it. I can Uh smell the sun. Uh I can smell the brightness, the joy. Yeah, that that's a gift. That is such a gift that it's interesting because when Chuck and I have talked about it, breast cancer was a turning point for the way we viewed life. You know that in our busyness, sometimes you forget, like you said, to slow down. And yes. from that on, if Chuck said, you know, you know, you want to go, you want to run errands with me, or do you want to? Why don't we just take off to the beach today? And you say yes because yes. you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. One of the core values that we have at Mark Inc. is that we believe in, in calling back to those behind us. Where when we lost our son Mark, the people that were able that had lost a child that were ahead of us, those that were able to come back and walk with us in our own journey and share with us about their own grief journey were such a blessing to us. And we wanted Absolutely. to be those people to other people coming behind us. And so we started, one of the reasons Mark Inc.'s vision is to offer help and hope to hurting people is we want to be those people who call back and, and, and with comfort and encouragement and, and the message that God is sovereign and you can trust him. Yes. And you, you have been led to found an organization called Faith Wears Pink, which really, that, I see that. I see it lived out in that platform. So how did that happen, that you began that ministry? Tell us about it. So I had finished my, I was very open on Facebook about my journey. And so I had kind of become the person that if someone knew someone who's diagnosed, they would say, you have to talk to Christine. You have to talk to Christine. And so I had my final reconstruction on New Year's Eve of 2013. And in January, I was texting three different women at one time that all had been kind of sent my way to to help them through their journey. And I was like, well, this one needs to talk to this one. And I wanted to connect them because I was kind of I was kind of the middleman. Right. I was trying to answer questions and ask questions. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to start a Facebook page, a group on Facebook with the 22 girls that I had kind of met along the way, some had gone through it already. Some were just starting. So I thought this will be good. I'll just start a Facebook page and we can have a conversation. So Mm -hmm. I, 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 it was called breast friends and I just figured it was a a method of them being able to converse. And of course my gift of gab that I have, I, I did a question of the day. I wanted them all to kind of get to know each other. So I would do a question of the day, simple as what was your diagnosis date? How did, how did you hear you had cancer? And it became this way that they could share their stories and their stories sometimes help someone else. Like you said, it's someone who's ahead of you that, that can kind of go, Oh, okay. I don't have to be afraid of that. And very quickly it grew to a hundred people because people started, the women started inviting others. And it was my plastic surgeon actually, who said, this is, this is a missing link in the cancer community. This is what we need. Doctors don't have time to have all these conversations. They need other women to talk. So he was actually the one that was the the one who was pushing me the most to keep doing what I was doing. And I had a I had a get together for the girls who lived in Dallas. The plastic surgeon paid for it. We met at PF Chains, and there was there was only like maybe ten of us that came there. No one knew each other. I was the only link that bound everyone together. And it was like there was no strangers in the room. Uh And I saw them laughing and sharing and, you know, hugging. And these women had never met each other. And I thought, okay, there's a need for this. There's a need for the connection. And let's go. (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) Yeah. And now that community has grown too. Yes. Yes. So it was my plastic surgeon that urged me to be a nonprofit. By that time, I think I had about 200 women. And he said, if if you go nonprofit, all of these things that you're doing can be funded. Because up to that point, I was paying for everything. 
Uh-huh. And so I was like, oh, I don't feel equipped to do that. So I prayed about it. And I, I found out too that I needed about $3,000 to pay for the lawyer. I wanted to do it right. If I was going to be a nonprofit, I wanted to do it right. So I prayed about it and I said, well, Lord, you're, you're just going to plop $3,000 in my lap. And so I started a GoFundMe page and I raised the money in 18 hours. Wow. What, a, what an affirmation of what yes. you were doing. Yeah. So we are now over a thousand women mm. and we had to go, we had to change from breast friends to faith wears pink. And even the name faith wears pink came to me in a prayer, mm. in prayer time. Uh, I so love obviously it. if you think of the title, it's faith, which obviously that's obvious wears, which you're being wrapped up in something. Uh-huh. And then pink, of course, is is the breast yeah. cancer color. <laughs> it's a great name. The way we met is through our marking ministries. We have a golf tournament every year, and we have it either the first weekend of October, the last weekend of September. And this year we said we wanted to give some of the profits to a, a faith-based breast cancer support group. And my assistant, Danielle, started researching and she found you online. And yes. as soon as she said, Faith Wears Pink, I thought, oh, I think that's the right one. I know nothing about it, but I love the name. <laughs> and so fortunately, we were able to connect and I was on your website. And ladies, I want to tell you, you need to check, check out this uh, beautiful ministry. It's a wonderful support group where women get to talk to each other and share their experiences. And yes. it's a very giving, very giving ministry. So Faith Wears Pink social media, but Christine also has a website and there's, she has a video there where she shares some of her story. It's really a fabulous ministry. And we will have that information in the show notes in case you're driving and you can't write it down. So yes, I, I hate to end our conversation, Christine. It's, you know, talking with you is <laughs> just so, I love it. I've just enjoyed every minute. And, but I want you to think about that woman who's just been diagnosed. She just found out that she has cancer. She's not even sure what that's going to mean for her. What encouragement could you offer to her? And maybe a, a couple of practical things that she could do as she's waiting to find out what comes next. Right. Well, I think the biggest thing is because when you first hear those words and you first, you're just stepping out onto the journey, you feel paralyzed. You feel stuck. And you're so afraid. And I think I think the biggest thing is you got to trust God in it. You have to take off your superwoman cape and, and let people love on you. Let people help you. Let people hug you for a change. Because I know most of the women I've talked to that have had breast cancer, they're like, I'm the one that takes care of everything. Well, guess what? Sit down. <laughs> let, us, let us help you. You know, there's there's going to be times where maybe your husband or your boyfriend or your friends or your kids can't say the right things to you. Don't don't blame them for that. They're struggling too. They they don't know what to do. They might not know what to say, mm-hmm. and that's where a community of of other survivors helps. You you know, draw to them. Mm-hmm. Um, trust your doctors. Listen to your doctors. Ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to tell them that you're afraid. It's okay to, you know, not question them, but, but, you know, just kind of look into your own decisions. I know there's a lot of times where you're forced with the decision of, do I want to have a deep flap, which is a, a pretty major surgery where they use your own tissue to rebuild your, your breasts, or do I want implants? There's a lot of, there's a lot of decisions to be made. And I kind of like building a house, right? You end up having to make decisions. Go into that prayerfully, go into that calmly, and you make the decision that's best for you. Don't don't be forced into something that, you know, well, I'm uncomfortable with that, or you know, do do your due diligence for your own sake. Mm-hmm. But I know it's scary. I I understand it's scary, but God's gonna be with you and others are gonna be with you and you're gonna get through it. Okay. One of the things that I had I had before one of my other speaking events, I woke up middle of the night and I'm going to read this to you. It's there is purpose for the pain. Just praise him as he executes his plan for your life. Pain, purpose, praise, plan. Mm. We, we don't go through painful things and they don't get used. If we're, if we're, if we allow God to do it, 
he'll do it. He'll 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 show himself up and in a big way. And it's 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 a blessing to be used in that way. Well, Christine, I am so grateful that you have uh, shared your story today. Uh, my guest today on the Help and Hope podcast is Christine Weiss and. I hope that you feel the way I feel, as though uh, you just got the diagnosis and this is the person you want to talk to because she has been so transparent and, and joyful, fulfilling her calling to bring hope to those who are hurting. One of the ways that we share the hope of our, our faith is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And we want to encourage you, if you don't know him, if what Christina said has given you an inkling of, you know what, I, I believe in God, but I don't know Jesus. I don't know the kind of faith that she has. Please contact us at markinc.org or helpandhopenow.org. We would be so excited to share with you the hope of Jesus and how to know him and to experience the kind of faith that Christine has been talking about today. I'm Sharon Vetters, and as I said, this is the Help and Hope podcast produced by Mark Inc. Ministries, and you can learn more at helpandhopenow.org. We're going to have all of Christine's information in the show notes, how you can get in touch with her through Faith Wears Pink, and you can find lots and lots of free resources at Mark Inc. They are all designed to help turn your heart toward Jesus, to give you hope in some of the darkest, most bleak places that human beings can experience. Stories uh, of redemption, of people who have been there, and they're calling back that God is sovereign and you can trust him. I'm Sharon Betters, thanks so much for joining us. Make sure you share, make sure you review, but most of all, make sure you share this story with others.